All right, so we're going to continue our uh, study of Friedman of course. And since this is our first class after, after, let me try and do, what am I doing here? <laughs> no, it's not good. Okay, one more effect. Um, okay. <laughs> it needs to be written off at one side, right? I guess it can come out very well, but that's my tribute to Steve Jobs and let's continue. Okay, so so we're gonna look at read Miller codes and there are there are several ways to view it. And uh, we saw that different views of the same uh, read Miller code gives you gives you different properties which we can exploit in implementation etc. Okay, so the first uh, let's let me remind you once again what is this read Miller code uh, comma m. Okay, uh, so so basic idea is when you think of a code word, okay, so you have to think of it coordinate wise, C0, C1, C2, all the way to C2 bar and minus 1. And this indexing, okay, so this indexing 0, 1, 2, etc., we think of the indices as different objects, okay, so that's something new in read Miller codes. The indices usually, I mean, they just go from 0 to 2 bar and minus 1, what's the big deal, right? So it doesn't really matter in any of the codes that we saw, uh, saw so far. But read Miller codes are basically evaluations on the indices themselves. So in a way, the indices play an important role, and how they tie up, uh, give, give, give us how they tie up with the definition gives us a lot of nice properties. Okay. So how do we think of these indices? Essentially, we think of the indices as m binary variables, values taken by the m binary variables. So we start all the way from zero, go all the way to one, taking all two power m minus one possible values here. And you think of each CI as basically an evaluation of some polynomial of those vertices. Okay. Right? What is the property of this polynomial? Degree of s is less than or equal to r, right? So for the r order read molecule, degree of s is less than or equal to r. Okay. So 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 the order in which you do the evaluation. Okay, so could be, for instance, you could choose the natural binary order. What is the natural binary order? 0, 1, 2, so on. They are integer. Both of them are the same, right? So, embed integers, embed binary vectors are the same as the integers from 0 to 2 power m minus 1. So, I can do it that way. Or I can do it in any other order. Okay. So, you should be motivated by some reason for trying some other order that is not the regular binary order. Okay. So, what can be one motivation? One way is to view these binary vectors, embed binary vectors as elements of g of 2 power m okay, and then that gives you a different order what is that order 0 1 alpha alpha squared so on where alpha is a primitive element so that changes the order in which you evaluate okay and we saw we didn't really fully prove it but i gave you some motivating arguments for why if you evaluate in that order and puncture the first k okay you puncture the first k and evaluate in that order what code do you get you get of course a very closely related version of the read miller code which we called rm r comma m star the nice property is that code is cyclic Okay, so cyclic and like I said, there are people have come up with formulae for coming up with the zeros of that cyclic code. Okay, so what zeros means essentially the generator polynomial. Okay, so it's possible to use that in the encoder. Okay, so that was one use for it. Okay, and then the last thing I saw I was talking about was uh, decoding, and I said there's something called majority logic decoding, which is going to be used. And majority logic in decoding involved finding suitable parity checks from the dual code. Okay, so if you remember right, I am going to talk about that a little bit more, but, but but to pick those suitable parity checks from the dual code, we will view this embed binary vectors as at another kind of entity. Okay. So we will view it as some other type of entity, we will think of it as what is called a finite geometry. Okay. So we will think of it as points of a geometry and we will think of lines in the geometry, planes in the geometry and that will give us a good handle on constructing these vectors, the dual uh, code word vectors which are good for majority logic decoding which are good for decoding. Okay. So that is a, a crucial idea in majority logic decoding. But before that I am going to talk about majority logic decoding in, in general okay, without reference to read Muller codes so that we get a handle on what it is about and like I said versions of this majority logic decoding are used even today in modern decoders. Okay. So it is a very, very relevant thing to study. Okay. Any questions on any of this stuff? Seems fine. Let's go. Okay. 
So one thing I don't have is a tutorial on read Muller codes. I'll try to add it over this week. Okay, so maybe hopefully today. If not possible, tomorrow I'll, I'll upload. Okay. Okay, so here's the here's majority logic decoding. I think I started this before we closed last week, right? Did I not start this? I started some part of it. So let me let me leave a reader it. It's good to see that. Suppose you have an NK code C. Okay. The dual the dual is an N minus N comma N minus K code. C code, right? So that's the property of the dual. If you have a code word C in C, and if you code have a code word B in C pop, C dot B is zero, right? So what does that mean? Zero or C1 B1 plus C2 B2 plus one to C and B F equals zero. Okay. So if you think about it. If I fix a V, okay, suppose I fix a V in the dual code board. What is this? Some for a fixed V, if V is some constant, this gives you some kind of an equation that is satisfied by every single code word of my code. Okay, so this for a fixed V, this is an equation satisfied by All fields. Okay, so that's the property of the dual. It's the definition of the dual. Okay. So in a way, every code word of the dual specifies a parity check that is satisfied by code words of the dual of the original code. Okay. So why do I say this is a parity check? Remember, each vi is either zero or a one. Okay. So once I fix a v, there will be some ci's which will show up here, some which won't show up. Okay. Right. So another way to write the same way: the summation ci. Equal to zero, I such that what? V I is equal to one, or equal to zero if you like. Okay, so so that's the this is thing. So in this form, you see that this is clearly a parity check. Okay, so wherever you have ones in the V I, those bits of the code word should XOR together to zero, should satisfy even parity. Okay, so that is the idea in the parity check construct. Okay, so in a way. So, so usually, if you have an unknown quantity, for instance, a decoding problem, the code word is unknown. Okay, code word plus error vector is what you receive. Code word is unknown. It's usually good to have equations involving the unknown bits. Okay, so entirely check matrix, entirely checks like this give you equations like that. Okay, so you have equations involving the unknown guys. You try to solve for the unknown guys using those equations. So that's how we we'll use these things. Okay, so specifically, what we'll do is. We will try to find orthogonal parity checks. Okay, so let me not start again. Parity checks orthogonal on orthogonal on on uh, say the i. We'll try to find these guys, but I first have to prove what I mean by orthogonal. Okay, so when I have a set of parity checks orthogonal on the i code, okay, so if I have b1 and b2 both belonging to the dual, so that b1 i equal to b2 i equal to one, and okay. Outside of the i place, v1 and v2 should not have any one in common. Okay, it's easier to say in words. If I try to write it down, I'll write it down like this. Okay, so that's all. J such that v1 j equal to one, and so that's all. J j prime here, v2 j prime equal to one. What should be their intersection? Okay. It should not have any other intersection. In fact, V1 and V2 should be non-zero. Okay, so so we'll say this is non-zero. Okay, I won't allow them to be zero. The zero then it's a, uh, it's not a check at all, right? Zero is just a zero equal to zero. That's okay. Okay, it should be non-zero, and 
and the ith place they should both be 1 in every other place if v1i is 1 what should be v2i should be 0 okay so that should happen all right there are various other ways of writing it if you want i'll try one more way of writing it so if you look at this guy v11 v21 v12 v22 so until v1 and v1 v2 and what should this vector be yeah, it should be this what is called the canonical ith vector, right? So, what is the canonical ith vector? 0 everywhere else, 1 in the ith position. Okay, the ith place should be 1 everywhere else. Of course, there are various ways of writing it, both these are equal. Okay. So, v1 and v2 are said to be orthogonal parity sets on the ith vector. Okay, so the word orthogonal needs that full interpretation. It doesn't mean that v1 dot v2 equals zero. It will not be zero. Right? What it, what will it be? It will be in fact one. Okay, so it's, it's orthogonal on the ith bit. Okay, so you should think of that as one phrase. You can't interpret it separately. Orthogonal on the ith bit. And then another orthogonal on the ith bit. If you remove the ith place, they will not even overlap. Not just being orthogonal. Open. It's a very strong condition. It will not not really overlap. Is it okay? So, you can imagine if I am trying to decode the ith bit, I do not know the ith bit, it is an unknown to me, v1 gives me an equation about the ith bit. Why is this v2 interesting? I have v1 already, why would this specific type of v2 be more interesting to me? See, v1 gives me one check on my code word, c1 to cn. Okay, so, I have one equation. Why is it that this v2 which is orthogonal on the ith bit interesting to me at all why would it be interesting not in this right so so in a way the, the information given to me by the parity check represented by v1 on the ith bit and the information given to me by the parity check represented by v2 will be what they will be independent right they will be statistically independent right why is that because they involve different code words and they are corrected by different error, ve error vector parts which are independent so they are independent so, whenever I have independent information like that, I can combine it much more easily. So that is one thing, one way to think about it and that is how it is used in modern decoders. So, people like these kind of checks for that reason. Okay? But for majority logic, we will do something far simpler. Okay? So, what I will do is, I will assume, so let us say suppose, there are J parity checks. Orthogonal on both i. Okay, some j. Yes, or j of them. Yes, orthogonal on bit i. Okay, so here is my claim. Okay, so okay, let me first tell you what this majority logic decoding is and then I will give you the claim. Okay, so here is uh, j parity checks. What are these j parity checks? Let us call them something. Okay, so so, I will tell you what these J parity checks are. The first check will be something like CI. Okay, everything will have CI, right? And the remaining things I will name it something. Okay, so I will say J1 uh, plus CJ2 plus one CJ, what shall we call it? Sorry, M1 equals 0. Okay, and then the second one, the again CI is going to be there, and then I will have. Okay, so this, this notation is becoming clumsy, right? So, what do I do? Let us think of some other notation here. How do I index it? Okay, maybe maybe it is just j1, j2 or something. Okay, so jn1. So, it is jn1 plus 1. So jn2 plus n1 plus 2. It is ugly, ugly notation, but you know what I mean, right? So, basically, n1 plus n2 equals 0. So, I want to the last one which is the category of one, it will again have CI and then it will have C something here, C something here, I'll go to C J Okay, so it doesn't matter what, what notation you have. What what do you know about these bits and these bits? They have nothing in common. Okay, no intersection. Okay, that's what I mean by saying I'm putting different notation here. Okay, the bits that I have here and the bits that I have here have nothing in common. Yes, here alone is common. Okay, so what can I do from the first equation? Okay, suppose I have a scenario where I receive 
So in the decoder, I'm going to receive R which is C plus E. Okay. I'm receiving R which is C plus E. Alright. So what I can do is to estimate the ith bit. Okay. So like I said before, these are uh, I think I mentioned in the last class. I was talking about how these major real logic decoders are bitwise decoders. We don't try to decode the whole block. We try to decode one bit at a time. So right now the decoder will try to decode the ith bit alone. How can it decode the ith bit? It will take the first equation and try to find the ith bit. How can I find the ith bit? I know ci plus cj1 plus cj2 so on to cjn1 is zero. Okay. So one one thing I can do is the first equation is giving me an estimate of C i hat and what is that estimate? I simply take the received vector and do the same addition. So R J1 plus R J2 plus so on to R J1. Is that okay? So this this people then you might be willing to believe that this is a reasonable estimate. It's not a bad estimate for based on the equation. Okay. And what about the second equation? Again gives me Another estimate which is R J and one plus one, R J and one plus two, so on to R J and one plus n. So by the way, I want to take this estimate. So again, R a question marks here, so you can see. Okay, so I'll put a question mark here, but it's clear what I'm doing, right? So I basically go back to this, these checks, and replace all the C's by R's except for the CI. CI, I will think of it as finding the estimate. Okay, so I'm look, looking at different estimates. So how many estimates do I have? J estimates. Okay, so how do I combine these J estimates? One idea in majority logic is to simply take a majority. Here had to be majority of CI at one, CI at two, so on to CI at two. For simplicity, you may want to think of J as odd. Okay, in case if it's even, then you wonder, okay, what if it's equal? What do I do? All that. So that's a bit of a confusion. Confusion. So let's just say we will take C J as odd. So that there's a clear majority, and the majority will give you the CI. Okay, it seems like a nice idea. Now my question is, you know that these things are orthogonal on bit. How many errors can this majority logic decoder correct? What is the error correcting capability for this majority logic decoder? Is, does it have any error correcting capability at all? It says for the book. How many errors can it correct? J by 2, are you saying it's J by 2, error correcting capability is J by 2, so it makes sense. What if I claim, <coughs> what if I claim, if weight of E for a vector is less than or equal to, let's say J by 2 floor, then C I have equal to C O. Is that correct? Do you believe me if I say that? Let's say J is odd, okay, don't worry about even. J is odd. Yeah. Variable set? Yeah. No, I am only worried about the ith bit, don't worry about decoding the entire code word. Okay, error correcting capability for the ith bit. I have J orthogonal parity sets. When will my ith bit be accurate? Up to what weight of E? Is this correct? The statement is true. Why is that? Yeah, so that's true, right? You see that? Okay. So if you have only j by two errors and you have j equations and all these equations involve different bits, they don't they don't overlap at all. If so, what most how many of them can be corrected by the error? J by two of them. More than j by two cannot be corrected. If so more than j by two are corrected, weight of e has to be greater than. J, uh, this floor of j by 2. Okay. So, error can see when I say corrupted, I should be very careful. Corruption can happen in a favorable way to me also. 
see if two error vectors go and corrupt the same thing then i'm okay right only when an odd number of guys go and corrupt something i actually make an error okay so so i'm being very loose here i'm just saying if any number any one error vector in any one error is involved there i'm done okay so if you say that my error correcting capability is clearly j by 2 okay so if v is less than or equal to j by 2 i'm guaranteed to recover ci hat is equal to ci but you can see already why so more than j by 2 also i might be able to correct several instances okay so that's the nice thing about these kind of simple decoders so it's not doesn't rely on major algebraic properties of matrices and all that rank and all it's a very simple decoder so even if you have more than j by 2 errors there can be several instances where this decoder will work right if there is an even number of errors in uh, in the places where uh, in these equations and the error has no effect at all okay so those kind of cases also it will work so it's in fact you can correct more than j by 2 in several instances but not fully but all error vectors with less than j by 2 can definitely be correct yes Do you know beforehand what my J is and what my branching is? So, so the question is, can I know beforehand what J is? I mean, I I can, right? Why why what stops me? I mean, I know the code already. I know it's dual. I go and search over each and every code word of the dual and find collect all the orthogonal parallel checks. It's difficult problem to collect the orthogonal parallel checks, but if you collect it, you can you can design your J. Okay, J is J can be a design parameter. It's not wrong. So. complexity of this process was it see the searching for the j parity checks happens only once after that you store the orthogonal parity checks after that what is the complexity you are taking j xrs and then finding majority majority is nothing you know, you just count and see if it's greater than something so, so it's it's nothing if you compare it with the reed solomon bellicam massy decoder this complexity is zero right don't think of the searching for the j as part of your complexity because you don't have to do it online You should sit down at home and do it slowly, or like take one year over it, and then implement it. It will happen only like in micro microseconds. It will happen. You don't have to do the search real time. Definitely. If you have to do a search real time, yeah, then it becomes a major thing. Yes. Here, my uh, J sticks. It's not like our uh, maximum uh, border distance decoder where I go across every possible value. So far, I told you I have to decode only one bit. <laughs> right? I'm just decoding bit i. So her question was, why do we have to keep searching for the orthogonal checks for each i every time? It becomes it becomes painful. And the other related question is, why does each bit has a different set of orthogonal parity checks? We have to store all these things. It becomes painful. Okay, that's where the cyclic condition will come and help. You. If C is a cyclic code, okay, right, what is nice if C is a cyclic code? C code is also a cyclic code. So I find orthogonal checks on one bit and done. Okay. So you just keep shifting it. You'll get out to my checks on the other bits. Okay. So that way, so using those ideas, the complexity can be handled. It's not that bad. And the other bit decoders are not heavily implemented today. Like I said, well, it's not very. I mean, today the Lucas MSC is not that hard. I mean, you can you can definitely implement it. If you are constrained by space and all that, power is a big constraint. Then you can think of the other bit decoders. What's up, brother? Is that okay? So this claim is clear, right? I don't have to really prove it. Okay. So this is for every bit. Okay. So think about what will happen if if there are more than j by two errors. Okay. So there are several cases where correction is possible. Okay. The fraction of errors correctable can be decent, even if it's slightly above the limit. Okay. So now, how do you find orthogonal parity checks for all the bits? Okay. So if code is cyclic, so that's the first thing. If code is cyclic. Simply shift the checks for for i. Okay, so you find orthogonal checks for one bit. You simply keep shifting it. You get orthogonal checks for everything else. Okay, there are ways to implement it so that it works out quite well. Okay, so if it's not cyclic, then it's a bit of a problem. Okay, and when will you say that the majority logic decoding? Achieves the full error correcting capability of the code. Yeah, so if it's cyclic and if j equals minimum distance, then you can be sure that it's achieving the full error correcting capability of the code. If j is not minimum distance, then you cannot be sure. Okay, and if it is not cyclic, you have to find j equations for every single bit before you can say that the error correcting capability of the majority logic decoder, blockwise, is j by two. Okay. 
but if it is cyclic, it's enough if you find for one. Okay, so if it's not cyclic, you have to find j equations for every single bit, orthogonal on bit one, orthogonal on bit two, another it could be another set of j, I don't care. You have to find j before I can claim j by two errors can be corrected for the whole block. Now I can only be we sure what for particular bit. Okay, so that's that's the other thing to keep in mind. If it is cyclic, then of course it's okay. One bit for one bit you find everything else. Okay, so that's majority logic decoding. There's some analysis you can do. For instance, if you say, but the if you assume, for instance, the weight of the checks, okay, the weight of all the checks is uniform. Just for simplicity in the analysis, you just say it's all say weight five or something like that. Then you have to look at when you flip each bit with probability p, what's the probability that an even number of errors will occur in the first uh, place, and then even number, an odd number of errors should occur in a maximum of j by 2 boxes. So it's a basically a bells and then kind of problem uniform like you, have, you can come up with uh, expressions involving the binomial terms and you can compute it. It's not very hard but uh, there is some calculation to compute the fraction of errors that can be corrected beyond j by 2. If the work to j by 2 you can correct it. Okay? Alright, so any questions on this? Majority logic, it seems clean enough. Okay, so let's. Uh, so we're running out of time today. So, 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 so. So, so what we'll do, I'll, I'll do a rough uh, plan for the rest of the week. So we're, we're going to do. Uh, I'll, I'll show an example for a read code where uh, where we'll, we'll take the simple A44 read code and find out the general parity checks. Okay, so we'll start with that and see how that looks, and then I'll give you some general results on how. In general, that should be orthogonal parity checks for it. Okay, so that's also an interesting, uh, interesting property to look at. And for that, we will need this view of the m bit vectors as forming a geometry. Okay, and we'll want to find lines on. So what's what's so nice about lines? And what is the connection between ortho orthogonal parity checks? If you think about it for a while, any two lines can intersect at most one point, right? So if you say the lines are the checks, then they are automatically orthogonal on a particular bit. Okay, so that's what's nice about these lines, I and mean, where all the lines have passed through a point, they cannot intersect in more than one place. Okay, so we we'll use that to find the orthogonal checks. And that will come to tomorrow. Okay, so we'll stop here for today. And so short class. We'll pick up from here tomorrow.